Welcome to the Test Podagogy podcast. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, many schools have created more flexible timetables, and in some cases that has meant longer or shorter lessons than the usual 45 minutes to one hour. Some teachers report the longer lessons being too long and the shorter lessons being too short. But is that just because they are used to the standard lesson length, or is the 45 minutes to one hour lesson simply the optimum unit of time for learning? On this episode, we try and answer that question with the help of neuroscientist Jared Cooney Horvath. Jared, thanks for joining me. No worries. How are you doing? Good. It's good to finally catch up. You're a long time Tez writer, um, our chief science correspondent, I think we like to call you. Um, uh, hey, I will take that. I'm going to put that on my resume now. Yeah, put it on your resume. I think you should. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about a piece that you um, wrote for us just in the summer about lesson length and, and yeah. the structure of the school day. Because at the moment with the COVID restrictions, so much of the school day is being disrupted. And people are having longer lessons, people are having slightly shorter lessons, you know, and, and everyone's going, well, this feels weird because we're used to a 45 minute to an hour lesson. And, yeah. and you wrote this, this really good piece about saying, well, you know, that's not like a golden hour. You know, this isn't, that this is. isn't set in stone. And so I guess the first question would be like, you know, is there much research about lesson length? I mean, we've got tons of research on teaching, but yeah, you know, what, what's out there that says an hour or 45 minutes is good or bad? Now, believe it or not, there is there is little to none. So the only research that really sits out there uh, in terms of lesson length and learning would be has to do with kind of the block lessons. Mm -hmm. So if we have a two hour class versus a four hour class versus a one hour class, do we see any differences in learning? But beyond that kind of research on blocks, no, there's never been research to suggest here's why we do 50 minutes. There's never been research to say maybe we should make it longer, maybe we should make it shorter. And there, there are hints out there across the board as to what would happen. But in terms of pure research, nope. Everyone just kind of assumes this is what it's going to be. This is what it always has been. Let's go with it. So we're, we're kind of in what I like to call cog fun territory. Where you get to use, <laughs> as I love this, this is where the translation comes in. You get to use research from a dozen different fields that don't speak directly to this issue, but that talk around it. And then you have to try and find that through line and say, okay, here's what they're all generally saying. Now here's an idea. Let's play with this. I think that's the problem, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's, not just, um, it's not just schools. You know, your driving lessons are an hour. Your, your university lectures are an hour. Your, your, you know, in, the, in England, we had the literacy hour. Why an hour? Like, but we had an hour. Just and, read for it. My, yeah. my wife's a psychologist. One hour session. Why? <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's the way we've always done it. Well, the good news is, so we, we can say pretty, pretty safely, we do know why it happened in education. Mm -hmm. And it was, <laughs> it's going to sound pretty mean on my part, but it was a cash grab from universities in the yeah. US. So essentially what, 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 what happens is a bunch of money was thrown up in a pension fund for universities, but in order to access that money, universities had to adhere to admitting students, only students that finished 24, what were called Carnegie units which one Carnegie unit is 120 hours worth of study on one topic. So you can assume, okay, 24 units. Let's divide that into four years. You've now got six units per year, assuming each year is going to be about 30 weeks long. That gives you, bingo, one hour a day, 50 minutes a day for 30 weeks to get your Carnegie unit. So it was really, we can trace everything right back to that moment when university said, we're, we'll only accept kids that do blank. In that moment, high schools, which hadn't traditionally been four years, high schools were just kind of hodgepodge institutions. Mm. They bled in with primary schools. They, some of them were two-year prep institutions. But almost overnight, they all became four-year institutions, and we've got what we've got now. Yeah, we've got strict lessons. And I guess in, in schools, it's uh, when they're timetabling lessons, they have this, this, this need to get all these subjects in, in secondary schools, I mean, and they cram them all in. And, okay, if we've got one-hour blocks, that's easy maths, right? We can just, you know, we've got six hours, one hour for lunch five hours left to play with to, to block them in. And it's sort of, there's a utility factor to it, I guess. It feels good. It's like, it's a, um, funny you say it. It's kind of like one of those Swiss army knives where everything kind of fits yeah. in there perfectly. You've got enough space for everything and let's have a good time. But is it good for learning? Now you pull it back and you say, okay, if school is meant to be a learning institution, is a 50 minute lesson optimum for learning? And then that's where you get to see, well, there's no direct research on that. So then you have to kind of dance around and say, well, we've got these ideas here. We've got these ideas here, these here. And uh, long story short, there's nothing to suggest that 50 minutes is good or bad. You can make it work. It's, it's always going to 
dial down to how are you spending those 50 minutes. But once you kind of get into the, the nuance of it, you see it doesn't have to be 50 minutes. There's a lot of other ways you could organize a school day and still get everyone to the same level if you wanted that without having to do it the way we've been doing it. And, and in the piece, you pull out some key factors that play into it and that don't necessarily agree with each other. But there, there's, there's three different areas that you pull out that, that sort of will feed into whether, what length of lesson you're sort of aiming for. Do you want to sort of focus yeah. on them in turn? I, mean, I think the first one was sort of attentional control or, or you know, how, how far a, a, a child can concentrate. Yeah, so you've got kind of, so we'll start with that one, which we'll call kind of a thresholding issue is <laughs> human beings. So the way the brain works is you got to think, man, there's a lot of noise coming into our brain all the time. I mean, there's just smells, sights, everything is just getting bombarded in there. So the brain has to have some sort of mechanism to block out irrelevant stuff and allow you to focus only on what's important. So the first port of call the brain has is what's called its threshold. Essentially, your brain has a very hard limit and it says, okay, anything that's stronger than this limit, you can choose to pay attention to. Anything weaker than this limit, we're just going to ignore it and you, you have no choice whatsoever. Yeah. So that's why I, would, I always say right now, you can hear my voice because I'm chatting to you, we're having a good time. But if a mouse in the corner sneezed, there would be a signal there. It would just be below your threshold. So you couldn't choose. There's nothing there for you. It's, it's the brain is determined already. We're going to block that out. Now, what happens is your threshold changes with time. So when you're in a situation and you're getting used to it and you're getting calm and you're getting comfortable, your threshold just slowly starts to creep. And that's the sign that your brain is saying, cool, we figured out this realm. Everything is safe here. Let's lock all of this out. So if anything different occurs, you have all your attention, energy, resources ready to go right to that change, to something new. So you, you think about it. That's why I always kind of say when you're driving to work in the morning and you got your radio on, you'll notice after about 10, 15 minutes, hmm, that music won't be hitting you as hard anymore. So what do you do? You crank the volume a little. 10 minutes later, you go, hmm that bass just not kicking what do you do turn the volume up what's happening is as you get used to the car and the sound of the road and stuff your brain's going we're safe and it just starts raising your threshold and that radio gets quieter and quieter and you have to ride above it so you've got about a 10 to 15 minute window till your brain your threshold will creep up which means if we're sitting in a classroom and a teacher is talking to us or i'm in a university lecture and i'm just going to listen to somebody talk after about 15 minutes it's going to be harder and harder and harder for me to pay attention. And you start to see this in research where you start to see how long do kids make it during a lecture before they either start A, multitasking, B, open their computer, or three, just start to tune out. And it's right around the 10 to 15 minute mark till it goes, whoa, that huge quickly. dip. That yep. seems like it's surprising. I mean, is that when you start doodling? Is that, is the, is that, you, know, Pretty, that sort of you can see people will start to ride their own threshold. After about 15 minutes, they'll start to, exactly, they'll doodle, they'll start to, get their knee bobbing up and down to try and add some noise, anything to keep going. That's when some kids will get up and walk through the back to try and re-energize themselves. Oh, wow. So kind of the good thing, well, it's just so you're not scared of this. The good thing is, is it's, it's really easy to reset a threshold. All you, all you have to do is change the context, somehow do something different. So you, if you ever are in a lesson with me, you'll see every 10 to 15 minutes, uh, we'll watch a video clip or we'll play a game or you'll turn to your neighbor and do something or you'll have to prove something to me. And everyone's like, oh, that's good learning. And I'm doing it purely to reset your attention so I can buy myself another 15 minutes before it starts to creep up again. All you have to do is switch the context. Saying somebody's name is usually enough to reset their threshold by another 10 minutes before it creeps up. So this means if you kind of extrapolate it, during a 50 minute lesson now, you've got about three periods that you've got to consider. You've got to say, okay, we've got a 15 minute window at the front till I have to somehow change the context. That's going to buy me another 15 till I have to change it again. And that should buy me another 15 to the end of class. Again, nobody thought about this, but now you can start to say, okay, what if class was 15 minutes? I wouldn't have to do these breaks. Or if class was two hours, could it go for two hours? Of course, you just need to keep doing, you would need six somehow minor shifts. Mm. So if you just kind of start thinking these 15 minute chunks, you start to see 50 minutes could work just so long as you're playing it in three sections, your intro, your middle, and your end. Here's our prep work. Here's you doing something different. Here's us coming back together to pull it all in. And that, that could work base, well. It's just, what do you like think? A very base human 
survival technique then is it, i mean is this are we going back to sort of base basic instinct with that like as you said in terms of the for the threshold and stuff yeah 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 oh yeah it's that's that's pure um if you want to call it lizard brain behavior <laughs> yeah. it's your your brain doesn't much care your brain doesn't want to learn so it, some people will debate me on this but it's there's a reason why psychology departments and neuroscience departments are different in schools. There's a reason why you can get degrees that are called brain and mind. Mm. You, your psychology is different than your biology. Um, we won't go too deeply into what that difference is, how it works, because that's, that's an hour in itself. But you can, this is where you get those battles, where you as a human being might want to learn, but your biology doesn't give a rat's patootie. All your biology cares about is survival. And it assumes that when you're in a situation for a long enough period of time and you haven't died yet, then <laughs> everything that's around you must be safe. In which case, your brain, believe it or not, give me a second on this one. Your brain doesn't sense things directly. Your brain only senses changes or shifts or valences. So the easy way to, to understand this, get three buckets, fill the middle one with warm water, the left one with cold, the right one with hot. Dip one hand in the cold, one in the hot, let it sit there for a minute, then put them both in the warm water. The hot hand will feel cold, the cold hand will feel hot. So you weren't ever actually sensing the heat of the warm water. All you're sensing is the differential between that stimulus and the other stimuli. The brain doesn't work on pure, it just compares things. So if you're in an environment, everything becomes cool. The reason why your threshold starts raising up is your brain goes, everything around you, all the smells must be safe. Once a threshold is up, now it's easier for it to discern anything different. If a new noise appears, a new smell, a new person, a new sight, a new sound, the differential is going to be so much higher because your threshold has made it, I'm not going to pay attention to this. Anything new, anything novel, anything different is going to register as a huge blip and your attention is going to go right there. So it is, it's a pure safety mechanism to make sure you have the cognitive resources to say, "Uh uh-oh, is this new thing going to kill me? Oh, it's not. Okay, back to normal. Is that why... uh... (laughs) A wasp causes havoc in a classroom or a, or a passing squirrel outside the, um, the window. I used to love that, the opening door. So we used to, the school I used to teach in, the door was behind the kids. So they're all facing forward. And if it happened in the first five minutes, no problem. But once you got to about the 10, 15 minute mark, if anyone would open that door, every head would just go, whoomp. <laughs> you could watch every kid simultaneously just turn backwards to look at the door. And I'm like, oh. I need to reset your threshold, don't I? I've just lost all of you guys. So when um, you know, someone will say, well, you know, someone will go and see the latest Christopher Nolan film and sit there happily for three hours. I mean, what's happening there? But is, is Nolan resetting our attention threshold with what he's doing on the screen? Video games and Hollywood are incredible at it. If you think about it, so the, what films do is they keep alternating sequences. They keep alternating scenes. So again, you don't have to do anything different. The context just has to surprise you for a second. The predictability has to disappear and you should be back to normal. So with, yeah, with a Christopher Nolan film is great is every 10 minutes, someone is going to do something that you didn't predict and you go, Whoa, what the heck was that? You're right back, back to normal. Video games, after a 10 minute level, what happens? You don't play the same level again. They do something totally new. Here's a new enemy. You now need to use magic. You're back in it again. So those, those are, yeah, I, I always said Hollywood Hollywood is probably the greatest place to learn lessons as a teacher. It's just most people never think to look there. But yeah. they, they know how to ride attention like nobody's business. <laughs> and then, but there's another aspect that you put in, that you bring into the piece, which is, which is a state of flow where yeah. these limits may, I, I guess I'll let you explain it better than I can, of course, but it's not that the limits may not apply, but you go into a different sort of place. Is that, is that broadly correct? Boom. So let's, so to understand flow, so there's probably an easier way to tap into flow. So we've got this one idea of a threshold, which is an attentional issue. Mm. You can assume after 15 minutes performance, understanding things are going to just start to drop a bit unless you find a way to reset that threshold. And you, by the way, I'll just say you, there is, so that's another good example of research evidence that sits over here. That's kind of tangential. If you have kids spend 15 minutes focus study on some material and another group of kids spend 30 minutes focused on that same material, you'd assume double the learning. It really only goes up, I think, anywhere between 5 to 30%. It's not a huge increase. You start to get these diminishing returns if you don't find a way to reset that threshold. So if if anyone's ever heard of the um, 
um, the Pomodoro technique. Have you heard oh, yes. of that? Yeah, yeah. The tom- so the it's, it's a, <laughs> the tomato technique, 25 yeah. on, five minutes off. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the person who developed it had any clue he was tapping into that, but that's what he's doing is, is essentially you're riding the threshold. You're figuring out that after 25 minutes of studying one thing concretely deeply, unless you've hit flow, your threshold's going to creep up and your return is going to be less and less and less. Mm -hmm. Take a break, come back, and now you can get that same return in another 25 minute kind of sit. Neither here nor there, just having a good, interesting think about that. But so concept of flow to understand flow let's go to another thing which is what i'll call processing power so your brain can sit in two kind of different what we'll call modes one is active learning mode one is passive prediction mode 90 percent of the time of your day you're in passive prediction mode when you're driving your car when you're cooking dinner when you're walking when you're talking with friends right now nobody is actually listening to my words right now everyone listening to your podcast is one to two seconds in front of me simply predicting the words that are coming out of my mouth. And so long as those words I say are even remotely close to what you think they should have been, you experience the prediction, not reality. This is how the brain saves a energy. Like when you're emailing and you know, predictive, you know, Gmail now fills in your next letters for you, next words for you. I mean, we say- and yet, bingo, we're, we're Googling all the time. We are the, we are the predictive text for everything. As soon as the smell starts, we predict where it's going to be. And that's, that's what makes us so powerful is we are ridiculously good prediction machines and we don't need to live in reality. We can draw upon 40 years of experience to say, yep, been here, done that. I know what's about to happen. Yeah. Now, the reason we have this mechanism is because your brain, even when you're in pure prediction mode, so when you're doing that, when you're watching Netflix, when you're just walking, 20 to 25% of all your body's energy goes up into your brain. So just to do pure prediction, your brain is using almost all your energy, all it can from your blood. Mm. In order to learn something new, your brain needs even more energy and it can't get it from the blood anymore. There's just not enough glucose that can be carried in there to get it to a learning level. So when your brain kicks into active learning mode to actually take in new information, change an idea, zip into the present moment, make decisions, it taps into a secondary energy source, which we believe is stored between the neurons in your brain. So just to keep it simple, imagine each neuron has a little cup of energy that sits next to it. And whenever it goes into active learning mode, it just starts sucking that energy out, which means you've only got a limit to how much energy you have to be in that active learning mode. Depending now, every night you go to sleep, you refill those little cups. But anytime you enter acting learning mode the next day, it just starts sucking it out again. Mm. So during one day, depending on how much sleep you got the night before, we reckon you can only be 30 minutes to, to four hours or so. So between 30 minutes and four hours, active learning time, taking in new information. Beyond that, you tap out. And any, any teacher who's been to a six-hour professional learning session knows this. First two or three sessions, you're in, you're having a good time. By the afternoon sessions, there's nothing left. There is no juice in here. Or the last so lesson before kind of, lunch, I imagine, is, is horrendous. And you just tap out. You're like, that's, I, got, I got nothing. That's because you, <laughs> you've tapped out of your extra energy. So here's another, let's just, let's extrapolate this. If we're talking about a 50 minute class lesson, we've already got another issue here. If we assume that most kids, let's just average it out and be generous and say three hours. Most kids can learn new stuff for three hours a day. If I've got five one hour lessons that I try and do pure learning in, there's not enough juice in there. So kids can really, if you, if you assume maybe six different classes a day, at three hours total, that gives you 30 minutes of learning you can do in each class. So my, my thought was always, well, why don't you just cram pure learning at the beginning of the day when we know they've got all their energy, all that secondary thing. So you just have six 30-minute classes that do nothing but rehash old material, bring in new material, here's your learning for the day. Now we go into what's called flow, where, okay, We've got active learning mode when the brain is chugging away, sucking up that extra energy. We've got passive prediction mode where the brain is just running off of blood and that's where we sit most of the time. Now we have a third thing, which is a very weird state that we're still trying to wrap our heads around called flow state. So flow state happens when you're doing something that you're deeply engaged with. So for me, it's painting. Whenever I'm painting, after about 20 minutes of painting, I just lose track of time. And now it's five hours later and I'm like, whoa, what the heck? just happened? How did I paint for five hours without noticing it? You enter into this state of just, you're in the zone is what athletes call it. 
Um, when you hit flow state, we don't believe your brain requires that extra energy source. So technically, you could be in flow all day and never tap out of energy. So long as you have enough blood and sugar, you should be totally fine. So flow state now suggests, well, cool, if I could get a kid into flow state, I could have class for five hours. I could have class for 10 hours and it wouldn't matter. So long as they're in flow, they're going to keep doing good work. Mm. So a couple of things to think about with flow then are, well, I guess there's kind of three caveats to it is one, you can only get into flow when you're doing something that you're familiar with and that's just kind of right at your cusp. So you'll never get into flow when you're learning something new or when you're practicing something hard. You only get into it when you're doing something that you're you're skilled at and you're just kind of living right at that edge with it. Like I'm getting a little bit better at my painting. So already we know flow will only happen during practice, not during learning. Two, you can't coerce it. So I can't force a kid into flow. It has to happen naturally through something that they want to engage with. And three, it takes a bit of time. It takes 20 to 30 minutes for flow to kick in. So it's not an instantaneous, oh, I'm doing it. I'm in flow now. It takes a bit to get there. So with flow, now you start to say, okay, maybe classes should be longer where there's never in a 50 minute class, there's almost no chance you're going to get a kid into flow. And if you do, they're only going to be able to be there for 10 to 20 minutes before mm -hmm. class is over and it's on to the next thing. So now you start to say, well, shoot, maybe we make classes 90 minutes or three hours where we now pick one project, something that they're working on that they're good at or some outreach project that they're really inspired by. And say, you've now got three minutes to work or three minutes, three hours to work, go. And we let them get into that flow zone and we just let them do deep, good work during that time. So I don't know then. So that's where I kind of put the, the idea of processing power and flow suggests to me that school could be little chunks of active learning, 15, 20, 30 minutes with longer periods of work, of practice. So here's new, new information we're getting in 20 minutes. Great. Now we got two hours to actually do something that you already understand, let's play. And believe it or not, if you go back to it, if you look at the research, the difference between class periods that are 30 minutes or less versus class periods that are more than 30 minutes, the learning is non-significantly different. So kids don't seem to learn anything more in a 60 minute class than they do in a 30 minute class. Talking about pure learning. That's depressing. <laughs> But if, oh, no, you teach, we, if you teach our lessons. <laughs> until you start to recognize that maybe, maybe teachers are trying to then play the flow game where they only teach 10 minutes during a 50 minute class and they use the extra 40 to try and get kids into a nice work zone. But I just don't know that there's enough time to hit pure flow in just that small time. So again, it's just, it boils down to how do you want to use your time? Are we going for learning? In which case it's got to be short, sharp, highly focused. Are we going for work? Are we going for depth? Are we going for output? In which case, we're going to need probably a little bit more time than the 50 we have to really let that simmer and come to life, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. And it seems like the ideal situation then is, is and um, if we ignore logistics, and because we're in a theoretical place, we can for the moment, we'll come back to logistics. But if we ignored logistics, a, a teacher's plan for learning would include time constraints, would include, well, actually person who does a timetable i'm gonna need a three hour block on friday because i'm planning a you know a long project or you know a personal project period where i think i'm going to get a load of my kids into a state of flow and i need that three hours but yeah. you know i'll give you back an hour and a half on monday because i'm only going to need half an hour and you know if we ignore logistics from what you said it seems that having the ability to be flexible with the length of your lesson will be quite a useful tool for a teacher and it would be how cool would it be if time was like like currency mm. and you could trade it with other teachers and be like, yeah. I don't, look, I only need, because it's, it's funny. There are some university courses I teach where, so every university lecture is one hour lecture, two hours, two. Uh, some courses need that. So there are some courses I teach that most certainly don't need that. I'm spinning my wheels for <laughs> one hour of that two hour, two. I'm like, I don't know what else to teach y'all. I got that. Cause it's, there's only, specific things I really need you to know. Yeah. So how nice would it be if I could divvy that time, sell that time off, say, yep, you give me an extra hour on this course. I'm going to give you that hour back over here. That'd be awesome, actually. And then you can really start to say, what do I need? How deep do I really need to go? Am I okay with surface knowledge here? What do I want to, I think that's an awesome idea. And I think, I guess this is where we bring in the other factors of not just the lesson structure, but 
the the this the series of lesson structure and and so a big thing uh, we, we've talked about it a lot and you've done a couple of columns on it it's like retrieval practice and space practice and people like like the idea, well you know if i've got 20 minutes here then the next you know the first 10 minutes of the next lesson is, is, is adequately spaced and that means i can do a quick quiz and i can see if they've remembered it and then a month's time and you know those longer structural periods are becoming much more um present in people's thinking about how they structure learning and then they've got yeah. this big gap over the summer where they're going well you know, how do we where's the retrieval happening in that six to eight weeks or even longer in <laughs> other countries so i mean where do you sit on the sort of the longer term structure of of learning so that's i i love what what you're laying out now is perfect is, is can we think in the longer term and when you start to think that that might mean because right, right now we're doing 50 minutes a day because we have to hmm. And we're doing that for all courses because we have to do 120 hours per course. Otherwise, a kid can't pass that course. Well, who came up with 120 hours? It's the same thing at the beginning. It was just, it's our Carnegie hour. There's no reason other than a cash grab. It makes, makes it so university professors could access a, punch, a pension <laughs> that we have. It, do I need 120 hours on geography and 120 hours on physics or could it be that I only need 80 on one or 60 on one and 200 on the other? Like, why do we decide if we think longer term, we can start to think, okay, we don't need 120 hours devoted to each subject. We don't need equal time devoted to each subject. I'm sure the teachers would say, yes, man, I could, if it were up to me, I would devote a hundred hours of every week to nothing but neuroscience. That's all <laughs> I want my kids to know. But I recognize that that's just my bias coming out. I'm willing to sit down and chat and say, okay, I think for a general learning degree, this might only need 10%. You can take 50% because that's a little bit more important that they know how to you know, read and write than it is the brain stuff. So can we pull ourselves away from this idea of a necessary or required time? Learning is measured by time as opposed to anything else. And I, I think if we think longer term, we can start to really kind of play around with that. But some people then go, well, what if we needed more time? So I think there's kind of two interesting findings that come out of this longevity. <laughs> some people go, well, we need a longer school year then. Because what if we just tacked on an extra 20, 30? So most school years are what? Uh, 180 days. What if we went up to something like China, which is 240, 250, 260. Some go up to 280. Let's do that. More time, more learning. Hooray, have a good time. The joke is, is when you look at, and grant, granted, this is kind of tricky because I, I don't put any stock in standardized tests. I'll just make that clear now. I don't, <laughs> I don't care about them. I, don't, I think they test absolutely nothing other than your ability to take a standardized test, which is great. Doesn't mean anything to me. Um, if you look at the PISA, the top 20 countries in PISA, in terms of score, they have an average school year length of 192 days. So that ranges between 180 and 240. Mm -hmm. If you look at the bottom 20 scoring countries in PISA, they have an average school year length of 192 days with a short <laughs> of 180 and a high of 240. School year length doesn't seem to correlate very much with learning. And we'd love to say that it would, like more time on task should lead to more learning, but we're just not seeing it. Mm -hmm. Don't know why, maybe it has to do with the organization. We'll figure that out. So I don't think the answer is then more school. Like, let's just extend the school year. The answer then comes back around to, okay, if we're going to stick with our 180 days, could we organize it differently? Right now we've got the, what the, we do nine months on, essentially three months off for summer break, have a good time. And what we tend to see is most kids during that summer break, during that three months leave from school, they, they regress in their learning about one month. Why would that be? It's exactly what you just said. We know that the key to th thinking, to long-term memory, to understanding is repetition and recall, repetition and recall. During a school year, I can't not recall it. Through practice quizzes, through discussions with teachers, through assignments, I'm always recalling something that I learned a month ago. Over a three-month holiday, over a three-month summer, I don't know any kid has been doing flashcards during that time. <laughs> so you just see essentially that last month of school disappears over summer because they never recall any of that information. And as teachers, we know that we tend to spend the first month of the next year simply rehashing what we did at the end of the last year. So really we've lost two months there, but what are you going to do? Now, if you go to a year round schooling model, 
So this is no more days. You keep it at 180 days. All you do is you do say 45 days on, 15 days off. 45 on, 15 off. You just start divvying it up with small breaks. What we see then is students in those kind of schools gain back that one month of learning. They have about one month per year better learning than, than kids with a three-month summer, which rightfully most people go, well, that's not a huge gain. Of course not. You didn't spend any more time learning. All you did was reorganize your time. And all the gain you could ever hope to get is that one month summer slump that you lost during that three months. And that's exactly what they get back. So now we start to think that, yeah, would there be another way to organize the year to start to say, shoot, we can make learning better, memory better without changing a thing other than when we're having our breaks. And over a school career, it's still a year's gain, isn't it? Because you've lost, you know, an average school career is what, 12 years. And, you know, you, you, it's a whole year. I mean, you, you, you pay top dollar for a whole year. Which, which over the course, you're right, over the course of a K-12 through ed, that's pretty dang huge. That would be a massive gain in, in all the wasted time when you come back of trying to rehash. But then you think, okay, <laughs> why do we, so go back, to, why do we have a 50-minute class period? Because in 1910, some dude decided to give money to professors in the U.S. Congratulations. <laughs> why then do we have a three-month summer? Would, do you, I'll, I'll actually put it, do you, do you know why we have the three-month summer? Like, what's your first thought on where well, that came from? I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question I know the answer to because you've told me. So, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the game and say, <laughs> and say that it's, it's because the har- they had to bring in the harvest. Dang it. I ruined it for you. <laughs> that was it. That was my, when I first started digging into it, that was my thought. That's the argument. It's the yeah. farming. It's the agrarian calendar, right? Yeah. We need the kids working the farm. And then you think about it and you go, wait a second, I've just planted my first vegetable garden uh, when I, last year, and I've realized summer ain't the time for reaping or sowing. Nothing <laughs> is happening in my vegetable garden during those months. It's like everything is just on hold until yeah. things start up again. So you realize that it, well, it was never an agrarian decision. It was, a, it was a city decision where when people were moving into the cities, it was getting stinking hot. Kids couldn't hang out in the classroom. It was getting sick. They were getting sick. It was fetid, I think was the word that they would continuously use. Yeah. So what would happen is during summer months, most families would disappear when it was super hot. That disappearing, of course, this is before airplanes and stuff, would take a couple weeks to get out of town, a couple weeks to get back into town. So they just started saying, okay, we'll give you three months off during the summer so long as you agree to be here, to attend school for the rest of the nine months. Kids say, cool, families are happy, sweet. Over the last century, we've since invented air travel. We've since invented air conditioning. We've since invented, uh, um, um, uh, what's it called, uh, airflow, whatever that word is I'm looking for between classrooms. We don't have the same problems, yet we use the same system. Even though today, the, the average family vacation length is two weeks, is 14 to 15 days. No family takes a three-month vacation. And if it happens, man, I want to be part of your family. <laughs> that sounds like an absolute dream. With work, adults can't do it either. So we've got this remnant of the past, which made a lot of sense when it happened. And now we're allowed to say, nobody's benefiting from that. The kid, Parents don't get three months off for summer. So you can't say, well, we're all just enjoying the heat. I'd love to enjoy the heat, but I got to work. So yeah, what it's really the- happening is the kids are playing video games, getting bored, while the parents are working their butts off and we only have enough time to go for a two-week vacation. What if we just made school a year-round affair? It's not a bad idea. And do you think, no, I mean, I guess if we wrap this all into, into to a conclusion on, on, on structure of school, given your, given free choice, given a, a free logistical, you know, parents aren't going to write to you and be angry. Teachers aren't going to write to you and be angry. But, you know, if you had a free choice, what would you do then? Would you have this flexible timetable and a, and a, and a more stop start school year is that what is that your sort of utopian vision yeah the the way i see it is okay primary schools would still start when they do fairly early i would love in a per, actually you know what in a perfect world high schools would start later because of sl- sleep issues which we'll get into in another time with teenagers but the logistics might be an absolute nightmare but logistics aside Okay, there's no traffic problems. Yeah. And, okay, no, anyone can get, we got a, tubes. This is a free shot. This is a free shot you've got. <laughs> Teleportation devices. So no, no one, okay. We got, 
Primary schools start early, like around 7, 30, 8 a.m. High schools start around 9 to 9.30. Um, yeah, 9 o'clock. Morning sessions are going to be pure learning. You're going to have four, five, six short 25-minute lessons on, that are just pure learning. First five minutes of each of those classes, you're going to review what you learned the day before. You're now going to have 20 minutes of hard learning, and then there's going to be some reviews that come throughout. Get all of your learning done before lunch. At this point, you can assume you've, you've hit lunchtime, you're tapped out of that secondary energy source. So there's no new active learning going to happen for the rest of the day. So what do you do during lunch? You have a nice healthy lunch, do some exercise, go out, play, replenish your blood glucose. Afternoons would be one long session or two longest sessions of one thing, of a project. I don't know if it's going to be math class, if it's going to be a science experiment, something where now we're de devoting three hours to one task so we can get into that flow state. And then off we go. Then ideally there'd be no homework because I'm not a big fan of schools reaching into the household, but that again could just be me. But that's, I, I think that put your learning, know when you're doing your learning and just lock it down and let the kids know it's learning time. During this time, it's going to be hard. You're going to struggle. This is going to be the difficult stuff. Afternoon time, this is when we're going to work. Don't worry about it. You're not being tested. This isn't, do you know what you know? This is let's build something. Let's do something. Yeah, let's go out into the community and do something. I don't know what it's going to be, but I kind of love that idea. But I think overall, if, if, if you have to take it home, I think the big take home is the world is absolutely filled with remnants from the past. And we, we just kind of take it. I was, the chapter I was working on, I, the three I came up with were one were daylight savings times. Did you know that that was only, uh, that was invented during World War I? was gone for most of the time and came back in the 1970s during the oil crisis. No, I didn't know that. I just assumed it was always, my dad wouldn't have had it growing up. It was, <laughs> I just assumed daylight saving was a thing, but it's not. It was instituted for a very specific purpose to save energy. We no longer have that purpose, yet we've maintained the practice. Pop songs, three and a half minutes on average. Why? Because back in the day when radio stations were becoming big, little 70 records can only hold three and a half to four minutes worth of music. So that was all they were going to play. Your song has to be shorter than four minutes. We now don't have that constraint, yet we maintain three and a half minute long songs. Why? Remnant from the past. I think a lot of our organization in schools, there was a reason. When you dig back, you can find a reason why somebody made that choice. And then you can ask yourself, is that still relevant in today's context? And if the answer is no, then we can play. Do we, have to be, do we have to be conditioned though? I mean, we expect a song to be three and a half minutes and we expect, we're trained to expect a 45 minute lesson. If we were to change things, do we have to be reconditioned or dehabituated? Can you? Yes. I think with some students, there will definitely be a period of change. Exactly what you said, that dehabituation where you have expectations, the world isn't meeting them and you've got this little clash. Start new students, so maybe keep all current students on a program. Start with new students. You can build them from scratch. They won't have any preconceived notions about what school should be. So it would take a couple of years to get people used to. By the way, that's why as adults at uni, they'll never get rid of the lecture because at that stage, at that time, that's all kids are used to. And <laughs> there wouldn't be a kid in the world who would love a hands-on class at uni. By the time you're a senior in uni, if someone's like, let's do a project, you're like, no, just talk to me for an hour. I'll take my notes. <laughs> And we'll go about our business. Have a good one. So you're, you're absolutely right. It would be hard to take like an addicts, change the, the current state. But slowly and surely, it could eventually happen. Well, if anyone out there listening wants to try this, I'm sure Jared would, uh, would come and be a consultant on your shift of timetable <laughs> and take the blame from the teachers. But um, I think if you, if you are trying it, I mean, maybe someone is already or you want to, do get in touch because I think we'd be really interested in as a magazine in that experiment. And I'm sure Jared would as well. From, a, from an academic point of view to see you know, how that yeah. goes and what happens. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be an awesome article to say, hey, we've completely revamped timing. Here's what we've tried. Here's what we found. Yeah, I, I think, think that's awesome. Yeah, we'll see. And I think we'll have to have Jared back to discuss all the different, I mean, I've taken so many notes next to me here that uh, I think some of them are going to be articles, some of them are going to be um, probably future podcasts or some columns from Jared because he does have a fortnightly column with us as well, which we're making free uh, so it's going to be in front of paywall. Um, so please look out for that. And the new, the first one will be coming in the next couple of weeks. But um, thanks, Jared, for that. It's an excellent interview as always. No, thank you. We'll, we'll do it again soon. 